started then. Um, welcome to our evening local author, Rebecca Copeland. Um, my name is Kara Kreckler. I'm the head of adult services here at UCPL. Um, before I hand over the, uh, the event to uh, Rebecca, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we are recording the program to post on our YouTube channel um, for those who are unable to make it today. So please excuse the camera. Um, also, please help yourself to snacks and drinks at the back. Um, and if you need them, restrooms are out the back door and to your left. Um, now I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Rebecca Copeland, who is here to read from and discuss her book, The Kimono Tattoo. A University City resident, Rebecca was born in Japan to missionary parents before moving to North Carolina, where she spent her childhood listening to her older sisters tell, share their stories about Japan. As a junior in college, Rebecca had the opportunity to spend a year in Japan where she studied traditional dance, learned to wear a kimono, and traveled, making lots of mistakes in the Japanese language. Um, later, she earned a PhD in Japanese literature at Columbia University. She is now a professor of Japanese language and literature at Washington University. And after her presentation, she will have copies of her book available uh, for purchasing and signing in the back. And there are also some available at uh, Subterranean if you want to grab some there. So, without further ado, here's Rebecca Copeland. Well, thank you, and thank you so much for coming out on this uh, chilly, chilly evening. Um, I thought today we could sort of uh, spend some time talking about the novel, The Kimono Tattoo, and um, the way it came about. And I'll be happy to talk about kimono also. I have a couple back there to uh, show you. And sorry, no tattoos. <laughs> Maybe some of you can help me out. So I'd like today to set the scene for the novel, talk about my background and the writing process, and read a few scenes um, from the book. This will be about 30 minutes, and then we'll have time for uh, discussion, questions, elaboration, and so forth. So let me start by setting the scene, introducing you to the kimono tattoo. This was published by Brother Mockingbird Publishers in 2021. It's a mystery novel set in Kyoto in a more or less contemporary time. I think it's contemporary, it's 2005 or so, which for me is like yesterday. But I understand with my students, that's like a whole other lifetime. Um, the main character in the, the novel is a woman named Ruth Bennett. She's 40, she's a redhead, she's fluent in Japanese. She's also a failure. She failed to get tenure at a small liberal arts college in Iowa where she taught Japanese literature. And when her husband runs off with another woman, she realizes she's failed at marriage too. Financially vulnerable and emotionally broken from these experiences, Ruth returns to Kyoto. I say return because that's the only home she's ever really known. Her parents had been medical missionaries in Kyoto, and except for trips back to the United States every four years, Ruth had lived all of her life in Japan. She feels most comfortable there. Now that she's returned, she is house-sitting for a family friend and translating business documents for a small translation agency. Her life is routine and frankly, pretty boring, but Ruth likes it like that. There's less opportunity for heartbreak in the mundane. So let me begin by reading from the opening of the novel. Um, the white parasol caught my eye. I watched the tip gliding along the green hedge, running parallel to the parking lot outside my window. Fair complexions were prized in Japan, and particularly in Kyoto, where many claimed the traditional values and tastes were stronger. Most women carried parasols when the sun was bright shielding themselves from the skin-darkening rays. Many carried them even when the sun was dim and long into the autumn months. I recalled the way the neighbor women approached me when I was a little girl out on, out on errands with my mother. 
They would stroke my porcelain skin, murmuring, Kimega Kumakai, her pores are so fine. I thought I was close to royalty until the summer I was 13 and my parents returned to North Carolina on furlough. All the girls in that lazy town slathered up with baby oil and baked under the sun. They admired their tawny brown tans and the way and the white lines left by their skimpy bathing suits. Next to them, my skin was practically luminescent. Here comes Casper. They smirked whenever they saw me. <coughs> Tired of the taunts, I spent an afternoon on a lawn chair under the sun until I turned crimson. My mother rushed me to the emergency room for third degree burns. Far less painful to be a fine Ford princess in Japan. I watched the white tip until it reached the corner and turned down my street. A woman in a gray kimono stepped into view. Even from a distance, I could tell the fabric was a kinsha silk. At the hem ran an asymmetrical design in gradated shades of blue and pale pink, resembling a mountain ridge, a flowing stream, a spring haze. The woman seemed very chic, her face carefully shaded by her parasol. I gauged from the color of her kimono, she was in her 60s. She walked with assurance, her black sandals clipping silently over the pavement. With each step, her kimono snapped open at the hem, revealing the white under kimono. She held her parasol aloft with her right hand, and in her left, she carried a shopping bag from Takashimaya department store. I wanted to catch a glimpse of her face, but a flock of pigeons took flight from outside my window, blocking my view. When the fluttering of wings subsided, the woman stepped beyond my field of vision. So that's the end of the opening scene. And Ruth's reveries are cut short by the sound of a doorbell. When she goes to open the door, she's surprised to find the woman with the gray kimono standing there in front of her. She has brought Ruth a tantalizing offer. She's asked to, trans to translate a novel by the long forgotten author, Tani Shotaro. Tani had once been a rising star in the literary world. The son, of, the son of a famous kimono designer family, Tani had refused to assume the, the family company and had been disowned by his father. Tani hadn't been heard from for over 20 years, and some assumed he had died. No one knows, no one's ever heard of this novel now that Ruth has been asked to, to translate. So the author is rather <coughs> odd. Normally you don't translate a novel before it's been published. But Ruth is intrigued, and frankly, she's a little, she's flattered. She wants to say yes, and the money that's promised is very enticing, too. But she knows if she takes the job, she may run the risk of losing the one she currently has with this small translation agency. Her boss has made it very clear that she is not to moonlight. Can she really afford to lose another job? Ruth decides she can, and she accepts the offer. Later that evening, as soon as she begins to read the manuscript, she begins to question her decision. The first chapter describes a murder, or what appears to be a murder. A woman's body is found alongside a forlorn riverbed. In the scene that I'm going to read next, the narrator uh, in this passage is not Ruth, but the author, Tani Shotaro, that she is supposed to be um, engaging with in this translation. So here's the scene. By the time I reached the inn, Satoko had already checked in, but she was not to be found in her room, the gardens, or the baths. When she still had not returned by 6 p.m., I decided to go look for her. When I stepped out onto the bridge spanning the Hokigawa River, I saw what looked like a woman resting along the rocky shore. 
difficult to discern in the waning light, she seemed to be wearing a richly patterned kimono. I hurried down from the bridge, and as I drew closer, I realized she wasn't wearing a kimono. She was naked. Had her body been painted? Stumbling over the rocky ground, I crept up beside her. She didn't move. I jostled her shoulder, noticing that when I did, her skin was cold to the touch. I also noticed that the, that the design coloring her back, legs, and arms was not paint. It was a tattoo, or tattoos. Across her left shoulder ranged a design of red maple leaves, each leaf so finely wrought you could feel them shimmer in the light of the newly risen moon. Along the other shoulder was a cluster of cherry blossoms, tissue pale, almost translucent. From the branches of both the maple and the cherry dangled Tanzaku poetry slips. Each slip was so intricately painted, the woman's skin had become the washi paper of the slips. Hesitating, afraid of what I'd see, I rolled the woman over. Her eyes were open, and her mouth covered in a thick, dark blood. Satoko. So that's the end of that scene. <laughs> um, Japan does have a rich tradition of, of tattooing from kabuki actors to um, Edo period firemen to contemporary Yakuza gangsters. But it's generally frowned upon today to wear tattoos in public in Japan. So it's hard to imagine, if you saw the Grammys recently, it's hard to imagine a Japanese version of um, the Grammys where tattoos are on display for all to see. So in the story, the, the, the character Satoko, who is uh, Tani's uh, older sister, um, is a fine lady, a, a, a high-class lady. So for her to be wearing tattoos, to have her body eat, is highly unusual. And um, um, by introducing tattoos here, I'm taking Ruth and my reader into a different kind of world. Ruth finds this scene in the novel a little creepy and even kind of distasteful. But following the, the next day, uh, her regret turns to Hara. Ruth sees on the television news uh, report um, a, a report that a body has been found along the very same river that's described in the scene I just read. Believing she may have information about a murder, she tries to contact the author. And then, failing that, the mysterious woman with the parasol. And she just keeps hitting one roadblock after another. She can't reach any of these people. And the more she tries, the more she finds herself being drawn deeper and deeper into a mysterious plot involving family feuds, kimono histories, fatal tattoo designs, and ultimately her own very secrets. As she's pulled deeper into this tangled intrigue, Ruth has to rely on her knowledge of kimono history, tattoos, and translation to unravel the mystery. As she does, she takes readers with her through Kyoto's pretty lanes and back alleys where we learn more about kimono artisans and tattooers. So that's, that's my roundup of, of the book. I won't uh, talk too much more about it um, and, 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 until Q&A, if you have uh, specific questions about the book. Um, and I'd like to introduce now my motivations for um, going this route, for writing this work. First, as was introduced, I am a professor of Japanese literature, and my research focuses on modern women writers. I'm also a translator, and I found in the process of translating, I'm often put in the position of a detective. I have to try to ferret out the meaning in a text and struggle to find just the right word to reconstitute that meaning into another linguistic system. 
So the mystery aspect of translation coalesces nicely with my own love of reading mysteries. A number of years ago, I discovered the works of the author Sujata Masi. And this is an American writer who has written a series of mystery novels set in Japan. She's now moved on to writing about India, but um, she has quite a number of novels that are set in Japan. And I love the way that Massey brought readers to Japan and carried them through different cities and into different cultural situations as they worked <coughs> with the um, main character, Rei Shimura, to solve crimes. A little closer to home, our home, there's Joe Shalom, who lives in Webster Groves. And he's created a very successful series of detective stories set in Shanghai. His stories are fabulously entertaining, and they also carry readers into contemporary China, sharing with us something of the challenges, the intrigue, and even the dangers in the current political landscape there. So I decided I'd like to do something like that. <laughs> and to be honest, I didn't have a clue about where to start. So I waited until I had a sabbatical from my teaching in 2012, and then I drove from St. Louis to Mountain City, Tennessee, in the Smoky Mountains. And I set up camp in a small rustic cabin there that my father had built in the 1970s. It was really off the grid, but it did have electricity and water, so, you know, everything I needed. No internet. You know, so that was the challenge, right? I was completely isolated. Um, so I, I had initially planned to um, write a novel about a translator. But as the novel began to take shape, I realized that the central image pulling things together was the kimono. As my work progressed, I felt as if I were unfolding a kimono, revealing layers and textures as the plot took shape. The process of producing a kimono is one that requires a considerable appreciation of time and effort. The process involves the collecting and spinning and dyeing of threads, the gathering of plants and materials for the dyeing. Um, it involves weaving and airing of fabric and storing. And all of these activities carry with them a measure of time. Yet simultaneously, the intrinsic beauty of the kimono defies time. Like all works of art, the kimono carries with it implicit in the weave, the weight, the design, a sense of timelessness. And when worn, the kimono binds the wearer to a legacy of art and family and of time momentarily arrested. This image of the kimono and the way that time accrues to it stayed with me as I wrote, pushing me to think more about kimono and the way that they are layered, um, both literally and figuratively, but also about the layers of deception that lead to a murder. It should, that was kind of a leap, but um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, it should probably be obvious now from this that the trope of layering is prominent in the novel, The Kimono Tattoo. And when I was asked by my publisher to come up with a um, tagline to help market the book, and I had no idea what a tagline was, so I struggled um, to, to work on that. Um, oh, I forgot to show that picture. But, um, so I came up with the tagline, Silk Unravels, The Tattoo is Forever. Layer by layer, the truth is revealed. Um, um, so readers quickly recognize in the, the novel the metaphorical connection between the narrative style of the storytelling and the kimono. But whereas a kimono has a careful design, plotted on the loom and marked out with dye, my novel did not. <laughs> And I found myself discovering the story as I wrote. I was to learn that writers come in two different camps. They fall into two different camps, more or less. 
Um, there are the plotters, those who carefully map out their novels in advance, and then there are the pantsers, those who just fly by the seat of their pants. <laughs> um, and and they, those, the pantsers favor instinct and emotion over logic and planning. And most writers find themselves somewhere in between these two types. Um, but I admit, I tended to be more comfortable with pants flying. <laughs> so like I said, I didn't know the first thing about writing a novel. And even after 10 years now and the eventual publication, I still feel somewhat uncertain about what I accomplished. I think most writers deal with feelings of insecurity and inauthenticity, so I'm not unique there. But I remember as I was writing, I kept all of my files on my computer in a folder marked translator. I didn't want my folder to say debut novel or mystery or anything like that. I had to be, I, it had to be kind of mis hidden even from, from me. I, I really didn't have the confidence to claim what I was doing. Um, so even as I was writing a mystery, I was keeping it a mystery from other people too. So I, I remember um, being in the, the cabin in Tennessee and uh, looking out the window and watching the birds soaring up over the, the mountain ridge line um, and finding myself transported back to Kyoto. I had lived in Kyoto um, in uh, 2004 to 2005 when I was teaching um, a course at a small program there. And I was also translating um, Kirino Natsuo's novel, Grotesque. Just as the name implies, Grotesque is a long, psychologically gripping novel that is extremely dark. And um, I was working on a deadline, and I could hardly allow myself time to push away from my desk and go out and enjoy the beauty of Kyoto, where I had never spent any time before. I had to meet this deadline, so I was mired in this really dark novel that I was translating. Um, and I felt trapped, in a way. So as I worked on the translation, occasionally I would look out the window and watch the pigeons. And I would watch the pigeons flying up off of the electric line, lines and, and take flight in a squadron and soar up and then come back to the, to the um, electric wires over and over and over. When I was in Tennessee then, I'll just go back and show the, the juxtaposition, sitting in Tennessee and watching the birds do the similar thing I was carried to Kyoto, back to Kyoto, um, and, and carried into the story that would then become the kimono tattoo. So that's where I started with my protagonist sitting in a room behind the Kyoto Zoo, watching the flight of birds gently, gently transform into a white parasol. Then I imagined the parasol carried by a mysterious woman in a gray kimono, walking the narrow lane to Ruth's house with this novel. It was almost as if my Tennessee birds carried me through a portal in space and time and delivered me back to Kyoto, where I watched the novel unfold before my eyes. So there I was near uh, the famous Nanzenji temple, behind the Kyoto Zoo, translating grotesque, and seeing play out across the screen of my imagination, another translator translating another novel. As the sun would set behind the eastern hills in Tennessee, I would push back from my table in the cabin, turn off my computer, and leave the eastern hills of, of Kyoto. So uh, I was living in Kyoto in a place called Higashiyama, which translates Eastern Hills. So it's sort of another interesting overlap. Um, as I would walk out into the fading evening of Tennessee, I chased the fragments of my story. And that's um, where I discovered the name of my protagonist, Ruth Bennett, 
And that's where the dangerous plot to trick her into a fraudulent translation first began to surface. So the power of these images gave me the strength to chase my dream. OK, so what if I haven't ever written a novel? I felt as though I were on a quest to see where these images would take me. So I clung to the mantra, write what you know, write what you love. And I knew about translation. And I knew about uh, Kyoto. And I knew about kimono. And I loved A.S. Byatt's um, 1990 best-selling novel, Possession. It's been a long time since I read it, but what lodged in my memory was the way the story unfolded on different time axes via the mechanism of diaries and, and letters. As the novel Possession progresses, the past slips into the present, and characters' identities coalesce and overlap. And I wanted to do something similar. It was probably a little too ambitious at my stage, and probably foolhardy to attempt to create different dimensions in time, different textures, and competing efforts to conceal and reveal the <coughs> truth. But that's what I was led to do. So here, I'd like to turn to the, my final reading from, from the novel. And I've, I've talked about the way the novel is layered, the storyline, the imagery, the narrative structure, and certainly the characters. Many of the characters in the novel are bicultural. Ruth is an American who is more comfortable in Japan. Um, her best friend, Maho, is Japanese, who is, but she grew up in California, and she would prefer to be in California. So one of the questions I wanted to ask with this layering is, what is it that defines us? Is it where we're born? Is it our language? Is it the color of our skin? If we peel back these different descriptors, do we get to the heart of the matter? Do we reach the truth? Is there a truth? When we touch the skin, when we stand back from the mirror naked, do we encounter the truth? What happens when the skin itself is concealed behind colors and ink? Where does the answer lie then? Layer by layer, the truth is revealed. So the excerpt that I will read next I, I think encapsulates the sense of identity and the presence of layers. Here, in this passage, Ruth is on her way to meet a friend. She passes by one of Kyoto's most venerable sites, the Nanzenji Temple, founded in the 13th century, with buildings that still stand from the 17th century. So here's the scene. The Nanzen temple grounds were nearly empty as I cut across them, except for a man feeding pigeons by Sanmon Gate. People love Kyoto because of its rich history. Almost any point in the city will yield a story about an event that happened there in the 8th century, and a later event in the 11th century, and so on. History wraps the city in layers. The waves of history undulate and overlap, allowing us to go backwards in time, even as we go forward. And my history was there, too, my stories also settling into the sediment. Whenever I saw the great Sanmon at Nanzen Temple, I remembered the way my little brother and I used to play there on occasion. We would wrap our arms around the pillars of the gate and try to touch each other's hands. Our arms were too short, but each year we seemed to get closer and closer. The pillars were lighter in color near the base from all the hands that patted and rubbed the wood in passing. My brother's handprints were there, and mine too, pressed into the history of the temple becoming part of the story. So thank you. And I'm um, happy to uh, entertain any, any questions that may have arisen. <laughs>
I've lived in Japan off and on for uh, probably you know 10 to 15, 10 to 15 years. So as a child, I was only there for three weeks or so, and it went after I was born. And my parents moved, relocated to North Carolina. So I grew up there until um, I was a, a junior in college. Then I lived a year and in, in, in uh, Japan, and that really excited me and made me want to learn more about Japan. So I went to graduate school. And after that, I went back for research, and then I went and lived and taught and worked in Tokyo for five years, and, and then I got the job here at, at WashU, and it's just back and forth, back and forth ever since then. So all told, probably you know, 10 to 15 years. Back and forth. Thank you. Yes? Um, I was just curious about something you said in passing. Uh, you mentioned you feel you are in our system. Yeah, so um, I, I, I have been an a, um, academic, right, um, a researcher, somebody who writes about writers, somebody who critiques writers. And I, so I felt when I started to write um, my own novel that I was an imposter. That, that, that's not my identity. My identity is a scholar, you know? And, and so it, it took me a long time to accept that one could be both. And that, in fact, many scholars are also creative writers. And, and creative writing involves scholarship. Um, creative writing involves a lot of academic research. So I was a little naive to think there was this sort of bifurcation in the to processes. <laughs> Thank you. And then, you know, I, I also I should say I have um, I have sisters. Two of my sisters are creative writers, and they um, they went to they got MFAs, you know, and I, I didn't, and so I I I, I might have um, a little bit of sister jealousy or something. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're legitimate writers, but what am I? So. <laughs> but they're, they're okay. They, they have never uh, accused me of uh, overstepping, <laughs> and they've been very supportive. Yes? So I gather that your sister spent more time in Japan. Did anybody go back to Japan to live? That's such a good question. And um, my, so my, my sisters were uh, older than I was, obviously. The oldest sister was nine when they left, and um, she, she, she did go back. Um, she, before she became a creative writer, um, she, she, became, she was a lawyer. And so she went to Japan and worked um, in law firms there for a number, for quite a few years. And then um, traveled <laughs> on all the money she made. <laughs> and then ran out of money, so she got an MFA. I don't know. She's <laughs> a profession, I want. But as a profession, we're pretty unhappy. So it's not unusual that she would turn to me in her writer. <laughs> but after she traveled, she had a lot of stories to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you talk about the 